This is a Commitment 2020 special in partnership with the New Hampshire Institute of Politics, the Granite State Debates. The major GOP congressional candidates in New Hampshire's 2nd District share an advantage. Voters already know who they are. Two of the top finishers from the 2018 primary are facing off again for their party's nomination. But this Republican rematch is playing out against a dramatically different backdrop. It was a different race, it was a different time, honestly. The candidates' personal experiences with COVID-19 and with racism have become part of the discussion. I lace up my boots and I, and I become a better person for it. The question now, who is better equipped to lead New Hampshire through these extraordinary times? It is about working together. And to face a four-term incumbent in November. I have spent my whole life running toward the fight. Tonight, the Republican candidates for the second congressional district. Good evening and thank you for joining us for the last of our Granite State debates before next week's primary election. I'm WMUR political director Adam Sexton and as you heard, tonight's matchup features two candidates who are already experienced opponents but share the goal of flipping New Hampshire's 2nd Congressional District to a Republican. Steve Negron is a retired Air Force officer who now runs a small business working with defense contractors. He has lived in Nashua for almost 30 years. Lynn Blankenbecker is an attorney and combat nurse who served most recently on the Navy hospital ship Comfort. She has also served in the New Hampshire House of Representatives. WMUR News 9 evaluated all legally qualified candidates and selected those considered most newsworthy according to its objective criteria to participate in this debate. The candidates will get one minute to answer questions tonight. 30 second rebuttals will be allowed at the moderator's discretion. Our questions tonight will come from WMUR anchor Sharice LeClaire and WMUR political reporter John DeStaso. As we keep our distance here in the studio, the candidates are staying distant in separate rooms at the New Hampshire Institute of Politics at St. Anne's Home College. And we do want to note we are recording this debate instead of broadcasting live. So to start things off tonight, we have asked each candidate to tell us how they would make New Hampshire a better place. And we begin with Ms. Blankenbecker. Well, thank you, Adam, and thank you, John and Charisse, for uh, for your moderation right, moderating tonight. So, um, New Hampshire is a wonderful, wonderful place. I moved here in 1993 to raise my family here. When we moved to New Hampshire, um, you know, it was our goal to have a place where we could raise our baby, where there was freedom, where there were good schools, low crime, and um, and we still love New Hampshire. We love everything about New Hampshire, the geography, and and so many wonderful things to do here. Unfortunately, New Hampshire has suffered a pretty significant economic crisis due to COVID. And so um, we have got to really work at getting businesses back up and running and get our economy going again. And so um, I'm gonna work really hard, bring my leadership and, and help in, in Congress to work with the governor so that the, we make sure that we restore New Hampshire to the prosperity that it was uh, enjoying before COVID. Mr. Negron, how would you make New Hampshire better? Well, absolutely. Well, um, good evening, Adam and John and Clarice. Thank you very much and uh, my opponent for being here. Look, New Hampshire has been under attack um, for the last uh, four uh, congressional terms. Um, they haven't had a voice um, in Washington. And to make New Hampshire better is to give them a voice in Washington. And I intend to do that. You know, we have this Custer cronyism that's out there that is actually taking not only New Hampshire, but this whole country to a way that we don't want it to go. And I believe that we, we here in New Hampshire and the Granite State know um, what we need to do. And so I'm looking forward to, to, to this debate and I'm looking forward to telling the folks of the 2nd Congressional District, you know, I was your nominee last time. Um, I'm going to be your nominee again this time. And so let's take the fight to Washington and let's make New Hampshire better. Thank you. Let's go to John DeStaso for our first question. Thank you and good evening. Granite Staters have now been dealing with the coronavirus for about five months. People say they're anxious about their health, kids going back to school, their jobs, and society in general. When do you think the pandemic will realistically end, and how will we get there? And we'll start with Mr. Negron, please. Well, thank you, John, for the question. I think the problem has become is that it isn't necessarily the pandemic itself, but our reaction to the pandemic. Look, you know, we can't have a, uh, a one size fits all solution. It's clear, John, that there are universes of folks, of people um, that we need to protect. And we absolutely need to do those things um, to be able to, to provide those protections. But I don't believe that everybody has to be um, sprayed with the same um, antidote. Um, I believe that we have people out there that want to get back to work. When I walk the district and get on the phones, they're anxious to get back out. Kids want to get back to school. Teachers want to teach. Taking the necessary precautions. 
But I think it's time is now uh, to start opening up not only New Hampshire, but this country. And I think the people of New Hampshire are going to be better for it. Because when we knock on doors, they're just, you know what, they're just happy to see us and happy to be getting back to life as normal prior to the pandemic hitting. Thank you. And Ms. Blankenbecker, your thoughts? Thank you. Yes, absolutely. So um, I, too, get out in the district and talk to, to voters from all the way up from Coas County all the way down to the Massachusetts border. And I hear the same, um, the same thing all the way you know, across the state. Folks are um, tired of being cooped up. They're ready to get out. And um, folks aren't, uh, they, they want their fears allayed. And so it's easy as a nurse to be able to have a good conversation with them about um, realistic fears. And folks are ready to get back to school. As I talk to the young children and the students, they're ready to go back to school. And the schools have done a good job putting safeguards in place so that every person can be safe. It's same thing with the workforce. One of the beauties that we've seen from COVID is that we actually have an opportunity to be able to work from home or go to school from home. So when people aren't feeling well, whether it's COVID, whether it's the flu, whether it's any other virus, that they're going to be able to have now a substitute where they'll be able to work from home or school from home. And uh, so we're, we're trying to put a positive spin on, on this and lessons learned and help people prepare for moving forward. Thank you. Let's go back to Mr. Negron. Uh, Governor Sununu recently put an emergency order in place requir requiring people at pre-planned gatherings of more than 100 people to wear masks. Uh, while you were at President Trump's rally last week in Londonderry, uh, you did not wear a mask. What message does that send to Granite Staters that a potential congressman does not follow the governor's emergency orders? Well, you know, when we looked at what the, the, uh, the event was there in, uh, in Manchester, there was um, over 100 people. That, that's absolutely right, John. But you know what? I was over to one side. Um, I don't think it sends a message other than, you know, I am a person. I make my own decisions. Um, there were, I wasn't the only one um, that was there. The president was there without the mask. Um, there were many, many people that were out there that were New Hampshire's uh, residents that were without masks. And I think that was, you know, and the governor did show up um, and he wore a mask. So I think really it wasn't a statement. It wasn't a political statement. It was just me saying, you know, I know my surroundings, I know my health, and I know that I didn't have to wear a mask, and so I didn't do it. I didn't look at it as some sort of a protest um, against the, the, the governor, John. It was just me making my own personal decision. But, sir, you didn't follow the order. What about that? Well, certainly, if, if that was something that the governor would have seen me um, and whatever the, the penalties were, he would have been within his right and jurisdiction to do that. But nobody there, there wasn't a single person that didn't have a mask that was actually challenged or anything like that. So I don't know what the governor's actions would have been. But if there had been somebody, I would have complied accordingly. Thank you. And Ms. Ms. Blankenbecker, you were also at the rally. And numerous pictures on social media show you taking group photos with people outside of the event. You also did not have a mask on. Why not be extra cautious around older and potentially more vulnerable people? Well, first of all, as you know, I had COVID and I have antibody to COVID. And so a mask isn't appropriate for me anymore as far as my ability to uh, to spread the virus. And uh, the CDC has come down and said now that if you're asymptomatic, you're not contagious. And so um, with, with my antibodies, and uh, the fact that I've had COVID, um, I wasn't uh, a risk to myself or to others. I did wear my mask, but when I was taking photos, uh, we agreed in a group to take our masks off for those photos. Next question comes from Sharice LeClaire. Adam, thank you. Good evening to you both. The push continues to develop a COVID-19 vaccine. A lot of money has been put into that project. The president has also repeatedly said how promising the vaccine development is and how much it will help curb the spread of coronavirus. When developed, will you get the vaccine? And do you think enough Americans will in order to bring the virus under control? And we'll start with you, Ms. Blankenbecker. Thank you. Um, I probably won't get the vaccine. I am in the military. If the military mandates it, then I will follow the military rules and get the vaccine if it's mandated. Um, but I believe in that vaccine choice. You know, this is a rush to market vaccine, and I'm and uh, as a healthcare provider, we we give research drugs and we give re well researched medications, and this is a rush to market vaccine. When you think about this logically. Um, you know, we've known about COVID since maybe January or February, and it's now August. So that's roughly seven months. You know, a gestational period for a, a human fetus is nine months, and we haven't even tested this to see what the impact would be on a full gestational period. So for me, I think it's a rush to market vaccine, and I think any time that you have a risk involved, 
then the person who is who is taking that risk should have the choice as to whether or not they want to uh, take the vaccine. But I personally, um, having had COVID and having had, a, had antibodies, um, I don't necessarily need the vaccine either. Thank you, Mr. Negron, same question. Well, absolutely, and I think um, all of that is a, is a personal choice. You know, we have flu shots every year and I make a personal choice whether or not I wanna, I wanna take it. Um, I think the situation is we as individuals, we as Americans, we have individual liberties and we need to make sure that we make the right decision for ourselves. Anything that's mandated to me, I, I, I get um, my back up a little bit because, you know, I as an individual need to make that, that assertion. I need to do the research. I need to be the one that makes that decision for me or for my family or for whatever the case may be. So I can tell you right now, I, I probably will not take um, the COVID-19 vaccine. I will research it. I'll read up about it. Um, I'm not your typical flu shot guy um, every year either. Um, so it's just my natural pattern, but I'm not somebody that's gonna go and look at a vaccine because the government tells me I have to take it. That's what I'm gonna do. Just a quick follow up to you both. Uh, Ms. Blankenbecker, if President Trump asked you to take the vaccine, would that make a difference? Well, President Trump is my commander in chief, and if he required it for the military, then I'd be taking the vaccine. <laughs> How about you, Mr. Negron? If President Trump asked um, you to take the vaccine, would you? Um, again, um, I would take that under advisement, and it's still, at the end of the day, it would still be my personal decision. Alrighty. Uh, next question comes from John DeStaso. Thank you. We asked our viewers and Facebook followers to let us know what part of the COVID-19 crisis is most concerning to them. This response came from Donna Whitney, who said hers is about, quote, the debt we are compounding. And she continues, quote, we need to be looking ahead and in balance, looking at this current crisis. And she adds, anyone buried in debt, how long it takes to get out of, if ever, how would you control spending while directly responding to the coronavirus pandemic? To Mr. Negron? Sure, that's a great question. And thank you, Donna, for the question. Um, I wasn't in favor of this massive bailout package um, originally um, because of the type of monies that was inside that package. To me, it would be a very simple litmus test. If, in fact, this money was going to be used for somebody or something that was directly affected by the COVID-19, that I'd be willing to listen to it and see if that was part of the package. It was clear that there were a lot of things in that package that were not directly affected by COVID-19. And I think that that was a way um, for the Democratic Party or the socialist-leaning left party um, to get things into a budget that they couldn't get through the normal process. Look, I'm a, I'm a fiscal hawk. I understand that there's these issues. We cannot keep on spending the way we are. And I think this, this first round, it did help some people, but I believe there was some bloated spending in there that never should have gotten to the street in the first place. Thank you. And Ms. Blankenbecker. Oh, yes. And I am absolutely a fiscally responsible person. And, and so, it, you know, when you look at the packages, the CARES Act and the, and the packages that came through, there, there was so much pork and so much bloat in there that, um, you know, wasn't going directly to uh, translating directly to COVID relief. And so, uh, you know, when, when Nancy Pelosi threw in $25 million to rehab the Kennedy Center so she could have a party there, um, this is really ridiculous. And we've got to be better, better stewards of our taxpayer dollars when it comes to that. Um, you know, we still have a trillion dollars left in the last care pa CARES package. And so that absolutely um, needs to be spent before we would even consider uh, another package, which I would not be in favor for at this point. The nation is healing. And like I said, um, unlike my opponent, I am a very fiscally responsible person. And uh, so I, uh, you know, I wouldn't support a, a blo bloat like that. You were invoked there, Mr. Negron, but let's let's explore here. How would you be different on on this COVID-19 response from Ms. Blankenbecker? Well, certainly, you know, her statement that, um, you know, she would spend the trillion that's left. I mean, that's indicative. Um, I would look at not spending that trillion um, if there was no need for it. So, you know, it's clear that, you know, that's if it's there, she wants to spend it. That's 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 the huge difference between uh, my opponent and myself. Your response, Ms. Blankenbecker? Uh, well, I, I don't think I clearly said I'd spend it. I said there's a trillion left. Why are we looking at another package when we still have a trillion left on the table? Uh, certainly, if there was an opportunity to not spend it, that I would be su absolutely supporting that. Uh, so, In terms of how you would differ from Mr. Negron on the topic, though, how would you handle this pandemic differently than he would in Congress? 
Well, you know, I mean, it's in, you, you can see by Mr. Negron's campaign budget that he's $300,000 in debt. And so he clearly is, is not as fiscally conservative as he lets, leads us to believe. Mr. Negron, you get 15 seconds to respond. Sure, Adam. Well, you know, this is normally we get attacks from Democrats in the in a primary. Now we're getting attacked from our own from our own party. You These know, this is this this facts. is a, this is the issue, right? That money is money that I lent to campaign. Um, that's my personal resources. She wants people to believe that I owe that money to anybody else. The person I owe that money to is myself. But she's been doing this for the last three months. It's not getting any traction, and it's just a sign of a desperate campaign. Uh, well. Since I've been invoked, do I get an opportunity you to respond. respond? Quick response here and then we'll Absolutely. move on. Absolutely. Yes. Well, and first of all, these are not attacks. These are the facts. And whether you borrow the money from yourself or you borrow the money from the bank or you borrow the money from China, we simply cannot have a person who believes that that borrowing money is the way to finance anything. You know, I do not want a congressperson going to Congress for me that is not going to be fiscally responsible and is going to be worrying about borrowing money and spending beyond our means. I am, a, I am the candidate who has been about staying within backer. those fiscal constraints. And so, um, you know, that, that just goes against my grain. Okay. Well, right, let's move on. Next question comes from Sharice Leclerc. Thank you. We'll start with you, Ms. Blankenbecker. You're a nurse in the Navy and served in New York City on the USNS Comfort, sent there to help if hospitals were overrun during COVID. During that time, you did contract COVID-19. How would you respond if you heard someone call this virus a hoax? Well, I mean, it's clear there's a virus out there. It's not to say, I think that the, there's a difference between the virus and the fear, and we had a, a exceptional fear. Now that we've seen the CDC reports where we, the original models of this said that millions of people were gonna die, and now CDC has come down and they have dropped their numbers of COVID-related deaths by 96%. Um, you know, most of the people who get the virus, and I mean the big majority, um, suffer cold-like symptoms. And so, um, you know, it's it's not, and, and that's what I had. It's, it's um, you know, and, and of course, any person who dies from a virus, we, we certainly have to take safeguards and protections to keep those people safe, especially our most vulnerable populations. But we really needed to get control of the fear. Thank you. And Mr. Negron, do you think people have overreacted to the virus? And along those lines, what would you say to a family member of a Granite Stater who has died, who is warning others to take it seriously? Well, certainly uh, to that family, a Granite Stater family, uh, my sincerest condolences um, to any family um, that loses a member. Um, and no, it's not a hoax. I think what, what the hoax is was that it was the fear that was pandering about we were going to have, you know, these millions of deaths um, as a result of this pandemic. And it's clear that that has not, um, that has not come to fruition. So it isn't necessarily, we understand that, there's a, that there is a, uh, an issue out there, that there is a certain population that is more susceptible, and we need to protect those. But the hoax was the fear-mongering that the Democrats want to do, that Ann Custer wants to do. You know, she put out a plan that talks about stay at home, don't do this, don't do that. We're the party of, of hope. Um, that's what we need to do. You know, it's about building our future, um, not keeping people af afraid. You know, there's a great... Um, picture there was one Australian sheepdog controlling a hundred sheep and the question is how does one person control a hundred sheep and it's by fear and that's what the Dems are trying to do to us. Okay we're going to move quickly through some different topics now with a lightning round. Please keep your answers to a brief 15 seconds or less. We'll start with you Ms. Blankenbecker. If someone tests positive from attending one of your campaign or a larger GOP event would you continue to hold your own events? Um, well, I would continue to use the, the social distancing and the safeguards that we need to put in place the, to make sure that everybody who's at our events are safe. How about you, Mr. Negron? Absolutely. I would continue. Um, but again, we would hold those and everybody has the right and the freedom and the choice to come and uh, attend our event if that's what they choose to do. Okay, this one goes first to Mr. Negron. Of New Hampshire's yes. many pro-Second Amendment advocacy groups, which one is the best? And name one specifically. Uh, well, that's tough. I think they're all great, right? Anybody that promotes and defends the Second Amendment, um, I'm for. Uh, you know, gun owners, uh, New Hampshire gun owners, I think are, are, is a good one. You can't, you know, anybody that's fighting for me and my rights, I'm for them. How about you, Ms. Blankenbecker, favorite gun rights organization in New Hampshire? Oh, I don't have a favorite, but I was, I, you know, I did receive the highest uh, rating from any of the gun, uh, gun groups in the, uh, from, sorry, from gun owners, uh, 
the New Hampshire Firearms Coalition in the state of all the congressional uh, members, so I'm really proud of that. But uh, I think any group that advocates for our Second Amendment is awesome, and uh, they all have my support. So first one to you, Ms. Blankenbecker here. You both ran for the same seat in 2018. What have you learned about your opponent from that experience? Well, you know, in 2018, we lost the seat by 13 points, and that that's, uh, you know, was a big loss, and we've had to overcome that, and we're moving on, but this is a new race. You know, what I learned was that where, where our campaign fell short was that we were having trouble with messaging, and we've done a great job getting our messaging out, and we've done, uh, you know, a great job. We've got a team on the ground, and uh, we've done a tremendous job, so. Um, that's time. Yeah. All right, Mr. Negron, what did you learn about your opponent in 2018? Sure. Well, let me help um, my opponent with some math. Um, the only thing you need to do is you have to get 50 plus, 50 plus 1. We got 42.2% of the vote, right? It's not 13 points. We, need, we needed 7.9. And that's what we learned. You know, our starting point is there. The people in 14 and 16, the nominees, did not come back. We're coming back, and I think the people of the 2nd Congressional District want that. Steve, the facts are the facts. It was 13 points. It was 13.3. Moving on. Uh, <laughs> this is going to be a little incongruous here, but uh, Mr. Negron, what's your favorite stop in the district when you're campaigning? Oh, wow. Um, I, like, I like the Redstone Rocket that's up in Warner. All right. How about you, Ms. Negron? Favorite stop in the 2nd District? Um, well, we love Louie Louie's in Lebanon. It's a great restaurant. It's been a family favorite from when we lived over in Lebanon, and I love to go back and visit that area. Okay, and final question of the lightning round, Ms. Blankenbecker. Should immigration from Europe be prioritized over other countries? I I'm sorry, can I, let me. I'll ask it again here. Can you here. repeat that? Yeah, uh, thank uh, you. And our final lightning round question here. Should immigration from Europe be prioritized over other countries? Oh, absolutely not. You know, we we are a land of, of immigrants and and certainly uh, we shouldn't be looking at where you're coming from, but the individuals who are coming into this this state of uh, this country. And so we welcome all. We have a, a process for folks to go through and we should be welcoming everybody and we shouldn't prioritize one country over another. Mr. Negron. Uh, not at all. You know, this this country is still a beacon of hope. Um, despite um, everything we see going on. So there shouldn't be any prioritization at all. Anybody that comes to this country has to follow the, the laws. We are a land of laws. There's a right way to do it. Let them do it, and then they're welcome in our country. Okay, let's get back to the bigger questions. And the first one comes from John DeStaso. Thank you. The country continues to grapple with issues of racial injustice, social unrest, protesting, police shootings, and violence. What do you think Americans are getting wrong in the current discussions about race and justice? Mr. Negron, first, please. Sure. Well, thank you, John. Well, certainly, clearly, um, my perspective is 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 heads and heads above anybody else in this race because I am uh, a Hispanic and I am a minority. Um, you know what? What I think that people are getting wrong is that they're listening and they're trying to see that uh, the Democrats are trying to paint that this country is truly a racist country. And I can tell you firsthand um, that it is not. You know, I was uh, interviewed the other day and somebody asked me, "Why do I say that?" And I said, are we better today than we were in 1950 or 60 or 70? And the answer is yes. Now, are there all going to be situations that we have to address? Without a doubt, we have to do that. But it's not an indictment against our, our society as a whole. And I think that's what uh, the Dems want us to do. They want to push this racism. They want to push this race card, see the things that are happening across this country. I, frankly, am not going to buy it. I don't fall into it. And so can there, are there things that we can do better? Absolutely. And what we can, we should be doing those. And Ms. Blankenbecker, same question. Well, certainly there are pockets of, of areas in our country where there are there is more uh, racism than there are in other pockets of the, of America, and it's definitely uh, a, a problem. And and you know we need to listen, and we need to listen with the intent to learn. And I'm in leadership in my command in the, in the Navy, and as a command uh, equal opportunity officer, we sit down and we have conversations, and we call them enduring conversations, and we have respectful conversations where we sit, we try to learn, and we. Try try to listen with the intent to learn. And so as we have these difficult conversations around race and we learn everybody else's perspective, that helps me as a leader. And that's going to help me when I go to Congress and be the leader for this, this state and the leader for this country where we finally get to having civil conversations based around mutual respect when it comes to race-related issues. Next question, Sharice LeClaire. 
Thank you. In 2018, Congress passed and the president prioritized and signed a criminal justice reform bill designed to reduce certain criminal penalties and recidivism. Pew Research Foundation statistics show from 2018 that the black imprisonment rate was more than five times the rate for whites. Do you think black Americans are disproportionately incarcerated? And what would you do as a member of Congress about it? We'll start with you, Ms. Blankenbecker. So, you know, it whoever does the crime goes to jail and I don't think that we're out there as a community our police officers uh, as are not out there just seeking out African Americans or uh, you know a particular race to put in jail uh, that that isn't that isn't a problem as, as suggested um, you know we we have got to make sure that we support our police officers you know Ann Custer wants to defund the police and this is going to create civil unrest and make our communities less safe. We need to ensure that we support our police officers and that we uh, defend our police officers. And those police officers that are acting outside of the parameters of what is uh, appropriate for a police officer, they should be held accountable. But um, no, I don't think that there's a targeting or a disproportionate uh, targeting of a particular race. Mr. Negron, same question. Yeah, thank you, Clarice. Um, you know, it's really funny that this president has done more for criminal justice reform than any other president. Um, and we see that um, clearly when there was a young lady that spoke at the uh, Republican National Convention that she was in prison for 18 years. And it was because of President Trump's policies um, that she was able to come out. I think the problem is deep rooted. Um, I don't think it's going to be fixed by a policy. I think it's, at, uh, it's a problem within some of the larger cities, inner cities. Um, that have been democratically controlled and run um, for, for decades. And, and I think that's where the problem stems. I believe that there isn't um, a situation where the police officers are out there targeting individuals. I do believe um, that we have to stand behind the police. I believe that there is a situation where they need to know that they have the backing of not only their local and state government, but of the federal government, because they're the ones that are out there protecting us. And so I think the president has done a great job putting criminal justice reform as one of his top priorities. Next question comes from John. Both the House and Senate have passed versions of a defense spending bill with similar provisions to rename military bases named after Confederate leaders. President Trump has threatened to veto over the renaming plan. Do you oppose renaming the bases? If not, what would you say to, to your constituents who might be offended by those names? Mr. Negron. Sure. Um, that's, that's a great question. And I would say I would vehemently oppose um, any renaming of a base. So having been in the military and having a son that's on active duty now when my father was in, you know, my family has 114 years of military service. Look, when we go to a base, we don't look at what the name is. We say, hey, did you serve at F.E. Warren? Did you serve at, you know, at Whiteman Air Force Base? And it really is a place that we actually come together because we chewed the same dirt there. And so for us that are on active duty, it is something, and I'm talking about today, I'm not trying to pay for the sins of my father 100, 150 years ago. Today it means something to us. If you're an airborne guy, you're at Bragg. You know, if you're a B-2 bomber guy, you're at Whiteman. That means something to us. And so for the people that have never served necessarily and want to change these names because they believe it's, it's sort of racially motivated, a number one, they don't understand the camaraderie that happens at a military installation that 30 years from now when you meet somebody someplace, you go, hey, weren't you at Whiteman Air Force Base? It's a call to gather. It isn't a call to separate. Thank you. And Ms. Blankenbecker, same question. Thank you. And our military bases are named after military heroes. These are people who contributed to the United States in very heroic ways. And uh, it's a huge part of our fabric. It's part of our military history. It's part of our military heritage. And it's part of our country's history. And it's, it's uh, you know, it celebrates heroes. And so um, I would be, you know, I, I support the president in his uh, veto of wanting to rename the military bases. I do think that we can be culturally aware and certainly uh, racially sensitive but uh, what we're celebrating with those names are the heroic acts of those members and their contributions that significantly shaped and changed who our country is and what our country is and so um, you know we cannot change history by changing a name but we just have to make sure that we don't repeat history next question from Sharice Nashua is one of the most diverse communities in New Hampshire. About 18% of residents are non-white. What outreach have you done to the many immigrant groups there and who specifically have you learned from or spoken to in the Gate City? We'll start with you, Ms. Blankenbecker. 
Thank you. So there is a great organization here in the state of New Hampshire. It's called the New American Republicans. And it's made up of many, many different cultures. There's people from the DR. There's people from the Congo, um, just all over the place. And these are folks who came to the United States with the hope of finding something better for themselves. They came for opportunity. And I have really enjoyed getting to know these folks. They're all supporting my campaign um, because they love what we stand for and they know we stand for them. And what's interesting is what they said to us. They said when we first came to the United States and started this organization, we were met at the, you know, at the shores by Democrats who were telling us, here's where you get your free food, here's where you get your free housing, here's where you get and they said, no, 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 no. We don't want free stuff. We came here for opportunity and we came here for jobs. And so it's been wonderful to learn about these new these different cultures and see how they have integrated and and just embraced our uh, uh, values values of freedom and opportunity and everything that's so wonderful about being in the United States. Thank you, Mr. Negron, same question. Well, absolutely. Well, Nashville is my hometown. Um, and to do something specific, um, not yet. I mean, I live among them. Um, they're in my church. I, I coach their kids in Little League. I coach their kids in wrestling. Um, I videotape their daughter's volleyball games. So it's a part of my fabric, right? There are, there's a tremendous, um, um, minority um, population in Nashua that I've that I've come to grow and you know I got to tell you Chris, this is something interesting for us you know they are tired of the way that the Democrats have kind of led them um, down a path um, there's going to be a sea state change in, in our city um, we're, we're going to do some things specifically in those communities but they're they're wonderful people they're you know there's Dominicans and Puerto Ricans and there's Indians and there's African American people from Africa it's an amazing city and it's a great city to hold up as a model because we have a wonderful one opportunity there to really do some things with those communities next question from John DeStaso thank you the Supreme Court recently sent a case back to a lower court that dealt with the program called DACA deferred action for childhood arrivals allowing some children of undocumented immigrants to stay and work legally in the U.S. Do you think these immigrants should be allowed to stay? And if elected, what type of immigration legislation would you prioritize? To Mr. Negron first, please. Uh, thank you, John. Um, yes, I was uh, aware of that Supreme Court ruling down to the lower courts. Look, um, the first thing we have to do is recognize that we are a land of laws. I mean, that's what that's the first thing we have to recognize. And I've always spoke that I think that there is a requirement and a need, and our president has said so, of, a, of an overhaul of the immigration system, not only the immigration system, but also uh, the visa process by which you come here. Uh, you know, I think there are people that, that are here that want to be productive uh, citizens. Not everybody wants to be a U.S. citizen. I think that's a fallacy that people want to talk about, that everybody wants to come to the United States to become a citizen. They could be here on visas, work visas, student visas, whatever the case may be. So I believe that we need to look at this, this program um, in its totality, not in just a single uh, instance, and see if there are some ways that we can better improve our immigration system, because there's always ways to make things better. And Ms. Blankenbecker, same question. Yeah, thank you. So I, you know, I, I feel like that, you know, my family immigrated here. My grandparents um, on both sides immigrated here. My parents were first generation in this country. And uh, they came here for opportunity. And so when we do have immigrants come to this country legally and want to become citizens, we do need to make that as seamless and streamlined as possible. And we do know that our immigration process is broken. And that does need to be looked at. And we do need to fix the flaws in that program. But you know, um, I also don't believe with coming over to this country illegally and trying to uh, take advantage of things that uh, legally born citizens in this country or legal citizens don't have advantage of. So for example, education. Uh, uh, children who are not legal uh, uh, citizens of this country shouldn't receive a free education over a child who was born in this country or a child who was a natural citizen of this country. Next question from Sharice LeClaire. Thank you. There is still much debate in Washington about climate change and what steps the U.S. should take to deal with it. In District 2, some maple producers and ski resorts have sounded the alarm about climate change adversely affecting their livelihoods. What legislation would you propose to help them? We'll start with you, Ms. Blankenbecker. 
Oh, excellent. You know, conservation is so important in our state. And we only have one planet. We got to be really good stewards of this one planet we have. And I, you know, New Hampshire is very unique that we have so many outdoor activities that um, draw in tourists and that rely on our conservation, whether it's our shorelines, whether it's our, uh, you know, our recreation areas for skiing or hiking. And so we do need to look at what is appropriate legislation and what's appropriate for safeguarding uh, those natural resources that we have here in the state of New Hampshire. Certainly we need to weigh in the balance, uh, you know, just how far we're going to go. But, um, you know, absolutely protection of our natural resources here is protection of our economy here. And so, uh, yeah, I would definitely look at legislation that we can put in place that would help preserve those things and keep our robust economy when it comes to our conservation efforts here in the, in, in the state of New Hampshire. Mr. Negron, same question. Yes, well, thank you all. Um, having been a scoutmaster for 15 years, um, the outdoors is a huge part of my life. Um, you know, we used to have uh, a program in the scouts called Leave No Trace, which whenever we went on hiking or, or uh, canoeing, we left it better than what we found it. So if there is some legislation that I would work with the governor, I work with the state legislature um, to do some things that would be in the benefit of, the, of New Hampshire in the second congressional, absolutely. Um, what I don't want to do is all of a sudden have um, these overreaching, downward directed um, issues or laws from Washington to tell us here in the Granite State what it is that we need to do uh, for our state. We know what, what we have. We know it's a beautiful state. That's why so many people come here to visit us. It's an amazing, it's an amazing state. That's why I ended up putting roots down here and becoming a, a New Hampshire transplant. So if there are some things that we can do to make sure that we still keep this wonderful state of ours as beautiful as it is, then I would support that. Next question from John DeStaso. Thank you. According to the Giffords Law Center, which uses CDC, CDC statistics, 1,500 children are killed with a gun each year, including by suicide. Gun violence is the second leading cause of death among children overall and the first leading cause of death among black children. COVID-19 has caused far fewer pediatric deaths, fewer than 100. Should the federal government be treating gun violence like a pandemic? Mr. Negron. Uh, no, um, John, the government should not be treating uh, gun violence as a pandemic. Look, we have over 10,000 laws, both federal and state laws, um, on the books, and it doesn't stop any of, this, any of this violence. The issue, when we have some of the situation, you'd have to look at what the situation was for these young children. If it was a situation where somebody got a hold of a gun um, that was improperly stored, then that's on the adult that's in that house. A law is not going to fix that. You know, um, if it was a parent that used it on their child because of some mental instability, then we have to look at the issue of mental illness. Um, everybody wants to look at you control the end, the end result of the weapon and that's going to fix our problems. The answer to that, in my honest opinion, is no. That's not going to fix the problem. We have some other issues out there we to look at. I think mental health is a huge issue when it comes to that. And we need to hold those parents responsible if they're doing some things that are putting their children in harm's way. And Ms. Blankenbecker. Thank you. Yeah, I'm a root cause kind of person and, you know, absolutely, it, the guns are not the, not the cause. The, the, the problems are underlying issues, whether it's domestic violence and that's criminal, whether it's uh, uh, mental illness and we need to deal with that, uh, whether it's, uh, you know, you know, cr any other criminal activity other than domestic violence. And so, no, we need to get to the root cause and we need to deal with it. W you know, if we have a problem in this country with mental illness, then we really need to sit down and start thinking about how we're going to combat our mental illness problem in this country uh, and certainly in this state. We know that we have a shortage of mental health providers. And so, um, you know, any incentives that we can give to get folks to go into those mental health uh, professions would definitely help but the, the problem isn't the gun the problem is the the hands that the gun are in and we need to, to fix the problem at the root and not at the at the gun next question Sharice LeClaire Ms. Blankenbecker we're going to start with you on this one Mr. Negron has said he believes not only that life begins at conception but that abortion should be outlawed with no exceptions do you think this position is too extreme no, I support life. Uh, I believe in the sanctity of life, and uh, I will always protect the unborn. Thank you. Mr. Negron, your position is that victims of rape and incest would not be allowed to have abortions. What would you say to a woman who is in that position and does want to terminate her pregnancy? 
Well, one of the things um, that people tend to forget is, for me as, as a candidate, me as a person and as a father, is that there are going to be situations where women are going to make that choice. Um, and that, that's their choice. I don't agree with it. But the thing that's important to understand is that I will always be there for them on the other side. You know, people think that because somebody makes a decision that they're going to abandon that, that woman. And that's not the case. You know, as a man of faith, we understand that there, there are situations that they're going to they're gonna make that decision. It has to be crystal clear that on the, uh, on the back end of it, we're going to be there. We're going to be there to care for them, to nurture them, to love them, and do those kind of things. It isn't like some of the other folks that are out there that will say, you know, if that's your decision, I'm abandoning you. That's not who I am, and I don't think that's anything that's out there that me or anybody else believes that. We need to be there for them throughout the whole process if they decide to take that child's life. Okay, let's go to John. Uh, Mr. Negron, you have said it was a, quote, privilege and an honor to be endorsed by the Family Research Council. A key component of the group's platform says, quote, homosexual conduct is harmful to persons who engage in it and to society at large. It is by definition unnatural and as such is associated with, with physical, with negative, excuse me, physical and psychological effects, mm -hmm. close quote. Do you agree with that statement? And if not, why did you accept the endorsement? And what message does that send to your potential LGBTQ constituents? Sure. Well, thank you, John. Well, first of all, um, all men are created equal, um, and they're endowed by that by our Creator. Um, and they were the ones who endorsed me. Um, you know, they do have some pillars that, that I agree with. They agree about family, um, and I'm a family man, and I believe that that's important. Um, so to, to the LGBTQ community, you know, I believe that everybody's important. Everybody has a right. This is, this is who I am. You know, you had to dive pretty deep into their, into their web page to find that. But it was they who, uh, who endorsed me, John. And, uh, and so, I st you know, I stand the fact that they endorsed me, but I, the fact that they are pro-family, pro-life, uh, was something what, is what I meant with my statement. And Ms. Blankenbecker, in 2018, the policy for transgender individuals serving in the U.S. military was changed. It now states that transgender individuals are not excluded from military service, but must meet military standards, including those associated with their biological sex. Do you agree with the current policy, and why or why not? Well, yes. So when we, I was at the Defense Health Headquarters and at the Pentagon when we were studying as to whether or not transgender uh, individuals would be uh, coming into the military. That was under the Obama administration when we did allow transgenders. The issue for us was really based on a medical issue. And so we as military members have to be worldwide ready to go, mobilizable within hours. You know, I was mobilized within 48 hours to go aboard USNS Comfort. And so if you are an individual who is in the middle of a treatment, whether it's hormone replacement therapy, um, you know, or going through the surgical procedure, we cannot support that in a battlefield or a wartime scenario. And so those people and I, are, are not considered what we call in the military fit for mobilization at that time. Now, less than 1% of America is wearing a uniform right now. We need every person fit to go to duty. And so that did create a medical problem and an end strength problem for us when we were trying to mobilize folks and send folks across the, the, the um, over you know into to battle and so we had to make those hard decisions about being medically fit not only for the health of the military force but also for the health of the individual when you cannot give them those uh, supportive services over in a battlefield then that does them an injustice as well next question from Sharice LeClaire President Trump has endorsed candidates in both other federal primary races in this state, the 1st Congressional District and the Senate. Are you looking for his support in this race? And if so, make your case. What makes you the Trump candidate? We'll start with you, Ms. Blankenbecker. Well, I was just endorsed by the um the American Conservative Union and Matt Schlapp, which I'm super excited about. That's a great endorsement and obviously one that I'm very proud of. And that's a, an endorsement that the president really, really values. I think for me, though, you know, back, uh, gosh, it was over a year ago now, I was aboard USNS Mercy when I got a phone call from Laura Trump asking me if I would serve a, uh, 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 on President Trump's Women's Advisory Board. And I was one of 37 women selected out of the country to serve our president in that capacity. I was so proud to do that. I'd be proud to earn his endorsement. I have gone from 
from all the way up in the Can Canada, all the way down to Virginia, recruiting and, and speaking to and uh, signing up new women for Trump on behalf of this president. I'm proud to talk about his accomplishments for women. And so I'm a great spokesperson for the president. I support him and, uh, and, and, and my role in the Women's Advisory Board, uh, it's been tremendous. And so I'd be a great pick for him. Mr. Negron, same question. Sure. Well, I was I was disappointed that I wasn't picked for the women for Trump, but but that's another issue. Um, the issue I believe is that the, the president knows um, what he sees in me. Uh, you know, he's made his decision in the first CD in the Senate seat, in the Senate race. That's his choice. Um, that's what he needs to do. Our goal is Ann Custer. We know that at the end of the day, um, when the smoke clears, that we're going to be taking that seat back um, and putting it in good conservative Republican hands. And the president knows that the fight um, is here. He knows that this is a state that he wants to win. And so, you know, if the president actually came and, and looked at the second CD, he'll see that I was the one that took the nomination last time. I'm the one that has, you know, just this wonderful um, institution, St. A's, just put out a poll and had me up on my opponent by 22 points. You know, so that's clearly what he'll see. He'll see that that's the, that's the candidate that's out there and that's probably the one that has the best opportunity to unseat Ann, Cast Ann, Ann Custer. Next question, John DeStaso. Thank you. Incumbent Congresswoman Custer has now held this seat for four terms. She has raised far more money than both of you. And in the past several elections in District 2, the Republican Party nationally has not thrown a lot of resources into this district. What makes you think this year will be any different? Ms. Blankenbecker. Well, I've already forged the relationships in, in uh, Congress with representatives who are willing to stand strong with me. You know, Representative Dan, Cus uh, Dan Crenshaw has endorsed my campaign. Uh, I could go on and on. We have over 11 representatives that have endorsed our campaign because they know that I have what it takes to be a congresswoman. They know that I have the leadership and the character and the integrity to be in Congress with them and help them get the job done for this country. And so um, they are standing with me and they're standing ready to support me. I've also been endorsed, like I just said, by the ACU and by ViewPAC and by Maggie's List. And so these are tremendous organizations and War, War Veterans Fund who will help me raise the money that we need to, uh, to get to DC and, and uh, get to work for the people of the Granite State. And Mr. Negron, same question. Sure, well, I had 117,990 endorsements last time. Uh, my endorsements don't come from Washington uh, because you know that's part of the problem. You know, why would Washington, well, we're always talking about those situations, why would I tout that? You know, I tout the fact that, that I know that, you know, we've got the most votes in a midterm since 2002. That's what I tout. Um, those are the things that are important, and that's the folks of the New Hampshire. Those are the ones that spoke loudly last time in the primary, and though we came up short in the general, you know, that's our starting point. And so that's why I believe that, you know, when they see that, 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 that we have the right message um, about building our future, that's where people are going to come and draw to this, uh, to this race. Uh, we have more money than anybody else um, that's in this race. We're using it judiciously. And, you know, Ann Custer knows this because she's, the, she's come after our campaign four times now, specifically calling us her opponent because she knows the one that I'm going to carry the water and she knows that we can raise the money to, to take her out this time. Next, next question, Sharice LeClaire. The U.S. is likely to experience economic hardship for months, if not years to come, if large portions of certain industries start asking for financial help. Under what, if any, circumstances would you vote for a taxpayer-funded bailout? We'll start with you, Mr. Negron. Um, I'm not a fan of taxpayer-funded bailouts. Um, I think that there's other situations that we can, we can do to, to help an industry. It have to be industry specific on what we can do. Could it be that we lighten some regulations? Could it be that we reduce regulations? There's, there's other ways to do some things to make an industry uh, more profitable, uh, more, more efficient. Those are the things that I would look for. You know, it is always somebody who thinks that throwing money at a problem is what fixes it. I'm not, I'm not that person. So I would look at whatever that is that industry is that needed to help. I look at across the board where there's some things that the federal government could do to help them outside of throwing money to them and then sit down with them and see what was a path that was beneficial to both. Ms. Blankenbecker, same question to you. And, and I agree, you know, I, I don't agree with um, bailing out failing industry, just like I don't agree with bailing out failing uh, 
uh, towns or cities that, or, or states for that matter, uh, that haven't managed well. I do agree, though, that if they are uh, struggling and we can help them with reducing regulation or reducing burdens or reducing bureaucracy, uh, then you know that might be an avenue to go to give them some assistance and help them get back on their feet. But uh, you know these wholesale uh, large amounts of money, our country is already uh, under you know excessive debt and excessive um, deficit, and so. No, I wouldn't be for bailouts. Next question from John. Thank you. ABC News is now reporting that Russia, China, and Iran are trying to influence this year's presidential election. According, that's according to a draft intelligence bulletin it obtained. How concerned are you about foreign interference and because it has to do with an election about the politi politicization of this kind of intelligence? Ms. Blankenbecker first. Well, we know that those are our bad actors from a foreign affairs and you know foreign relations perspective. And when I was at the Pentagon and studying, you know, and we were preparing the defense uh, strategy, the national defense strategy. Uh, they actually, you know, they they were key players in there. And we know that they have a vested interest in making sure that they can undermine this country any way they can. They would no more, you know, they they absolutely would want to not see Donald J. Trump be our president. He is a, a skilled negotiator. He takes no no prisoners and he is he he uh, definitely is a, a force to be reckoned with in with these foreign bad actors and so uh, I can absolutely see that they would be wanting to get involved and ensure that President Donald J Trump isn't our president again thank you mr. Negron please same question sure thank you John you know having sat on the election law committee when I was uh, in the state house um, this was always a topic of, of concern and, and no, nobody should be allowed uh, to, to try to rig or infiltrate or sway our elections. You know, I love the fact that here in the great state of New Hampshire, we fill in a bubble and it gets through a, 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 an optical reader. Um, the thing that scares me sometimes if you have these online um, voting um, procedures and machines, um, which the Dems want to be able to do, I think that becomes a bigger threat and a bigger risk. Uh, you know, people don't realize this, but 6% of the voting machines that are out there are controlled by two individuals. That's George Soros and, uh, and an another guy from Utah, actually. Matter of fact, it's Mitt Romney. So, you know, those things do scare me. But here's what's important that we as individuals, as American voters, we need to make that decision on our own. We need to be the ones that do our own education. We're the ones that make our own decisions based on the information that we have. And if anybody out there is found trying to influence our system, they should be prosecuted to the full extent of the law. Just a quick follow up. Ms. Blankenbecker, do you worry about this information being politicized, though, in this election season? Um. Well, you know, everything is politicized during, I mean, COVID's politicized during this election season. And so, uh, you know, yes, I, but, but we've, we've definitely got to address the issue head on and, uh, and make sure that we don't have any foreign uh, influence into our elections and that the American people get to duly elect the president in this country and not letting foreign actors have an influence. Mr. Negron, how about you? Worried about the politicization? I, I am. I am, Adam, you know, and it is, you know, when you see people get on, they start fake Facebook accounts and they start, you know, a bunch of trouble internal to Facebook when they start swaying people. Yeah, that, that's bothersome to me. I think Facebook has some accountability to do those kind of things. So absolutely. But at the end of the day, as I said earlier, you know, we need to be responsible for our own decisions. And I think we need to be able to be accountable. A final question now before closing statements. You've both served your country and defended the right to vote. Regardless of a person's party or beliefs, what do you have to say to Granite Staters tonight about how important their role is to our democracy, especially those who may feel like their vote doesn't matter? Mr. Negron? Sure. Um, in 1974, the United States Senate race here in the great state of New Hampshire was decided by two votes. So your vote does matter. Never think for one second that it doesn't. And it isn't just a vote at the federal level. It's a vote at your state, city, and town level. You know, that's where all the things, you know, for those of us that are conservative, that's how we regain control. We started at the local level. We started on the school boards. We started on the planning boards. So your vote does count. And, and at any time you think that, that it doesn't, you need to look at those people that were in, um, I think it was in Afghanistan or Iran, that voted for the first time how proud they were that they finally had an opportunity to vote. So I would tell you, it's, it's a gift to vote. Um, you do make a difference, every single one of you. Um, so I would urge you, come September 8th, uh, to vote, um, and then follow on into November 3rd. So please do so. Ms. Blankenbecker. 
Well, you know, I feel like I have the most noble job in the United States Navy, and that's the ability to, you know, to take care of our warriors as they protect and defend our Constitution. And we enjoy constitutional freedoms in this country that other members of other countries do not have. And so um, I encourage all of you to honor those members, honor the people who wear a uniform, who every single day protect and defend your right to vote. This is such a privilege. And having sat over in countries um, over the last 34 years where people didn't have the right to vote, it is such a privilege. And so. Um, Honor our sons and daughters who have gone before us and are serving now, that have sacrificed for you to have that constitutional right. Get out, pick the candidate of your choice, and, uh, and feel proud about the fact that you live in a country where you have the freedom to vote. We have given the candidates time to make a closing statement, and let's begin with Ms. Blankenbecker. Thank you so much. First of all, I want to thank you, Adam. Thank you, John and Sharice and uh, the viewer audience and, and Mr. Negron. Thank you very much. You know, um, our current representative, Ann Custer, openly admits that she is afraid of Nancy Pelosi and she runs and hides. And we need a congresswoman who's going to stand strong for New Hampshire. I have stood strong for, for 34 years. I have uh, run to the fight, whether it was in Desert Shield, Desert Storm, whether it was in Afghanistan where I held a bomb in my hand where I cared for patients over there, or when it was most recently when I served aboard the USNS Comfort. And I will continue to stand strong for our law enforcement, our Constitution and our Second Amendment rights, for uh, our, our uh, economy, for securing our borders and for life. So this election is so important. We are on the cusp of socialism and I encourage all of you, please get out and vote. And um, you know, we have an opportunity to, to change the seat and take back CD2. So, uh, so get out and vote and uh, please check us out. Join the fight tonight at flankenbecker.com and uh, Blanken get out Becker, and vote on September We're gonna go 8th. to Mr. Negron for a closing statement. Sure. Well, thank you, Adam, Clarice, and John, and um, Ms. Blankenbeaker, thank you. Look, this isn't about me. This is about removing somebody that has put this state in a precarious situation. This is about Custer cronyism. This is about being Nancy Pelosi's puppet. This is about her bringing big city ideals to our state. This is about her impeaching our president. This is about her picking a Democratic nominee that wants to uh, abolish the Electoral College, which will ruin and take away our voice uh, for the first in the nation primary. This is about a woman who just backed um, Dan Feltis here in the state that wants to tax you. This is about you getting your voice back. I won last time in a hard fought race out of seven. I know what it takes to defeat Ann Custer. She doesn't want me to see me on this stage. So September 8th, as we talked about earlier, it's important. I would appreciate your vote on September 8th and then again on November 3rd. Thank you and God bless. We do want to thank the candidates for their time tonight and the panelists for being part of this debate. And of course, we thank you for joining us for these Granite State debates. You will find a link to all of this week's debates in the Commitment 2020 section of WMUR.com and our mobile app, as well as more information on all the candidates and resources for casting your ballot in next week's primary election. Have a good night. And thanks for watching.